The other thing is you can't evolve if there's no governance system. Bitcoin has been around for everything. It was the first. And every great idea started in the Bitcoin space, from side chains to smart contracts to all these other things. They were unable to do it because the infrastructure was not amenable to updating and upgrading to it. And now it's gotten to a point where it's truly a religion. You got Max Kaiser walking around baptizing people, and you know people say the word of Satoshi. You have people walking around handing out the white paper printed in a binding that makes it look like a Bible. I mean, you've been to these conferences, you've seen these people do this. It's a crazy thing. Uh, and so when you have an environment where there's a worshiping of the original canon and an inability to make decisions to change it, it means your innovation goes to zero and your stability goes to maximum, so you're never gonna change. But if you're not a perfect system and you can't solve real world problems, like I can't issue an asset, I can't do an identity system, I can't easily do smart contracts, it's very expensive to transact, I really can't store a lot of metadata. There's all kinds of problems there that are real problems. And I'm using more energy than the country of Switzerland to run it. And then you go to the adherents and say, what's your solution to fix these things or upgrade out? You talk to Vitalik, he says F2. You talk to Bitcoin and say, you're the problem, not us. Learn the word of Satoshi. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a serious problem. So I think the only winners are going to be in the three to five year period are the people who figure out how to get rid of the cult and how to get to a decentralized government that's just as effective as a standards body or something else and to get a regular upgrade cadence and then you can just have an all-you-can-eat buffet of open source technology and you can take a look at all these cool experiments and bring them in and put them into the product and I think that's one of the hallmarks of Cardano you know it's uh, we had three pillars and one of them was sustainability and within that pillar wasn't just energy efficiency it was also the sustainability of upgrading and getting rid of centralized custodians, getting rid of centralized governance, and getting to a point where a large group of people can coordinate through a decentralized way and make decisions and eventually have those decisions reflected as hard forks so you can change the protocol. Bitcoin is saying we only want money and it just needs to be as robust as possible. And then you have the others that are saying we want everything in it. We want to be able to, you know, baptize my dog on chain or whatever. They just want to add all these fit features. And you're saying that, you know, the Bitcoin people, they're scoffing, they're saying that's a problem. I think the big the issue is not that they're not incorporating those things. I think it's that they're pushing back about against the people who are innovating and saying, actually, we don't need any of those things that you're adding. Right. This is enough. They're really scoffing at the idea that these are actually valuable tools that we should be looking into Like now that we have blockchain technology. Right. Well, then what is Bitcoin useful for then? That's the question I always ask the maximalists. They say, well, if it's money, it's not a particularly good one because it's volatile, really slow settlement times and very expensive to transact. Oh, it's a digital store of value. Oh, OK, well, then you're always asking question of efficiency. Is it worth the cost to build a system with this type of store of value? They say, well, that's a feature, not a bug. The fact that it costs so much to make it is what makes it valuable. OK, well, then why are all these other things that it doesn't cost so much to make valuable? And they say, oh, that's because it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it's, Obviously. Yeah, and, and they just listen to this stuff. It's like, OK, there is only one true God, and his name is Satoshi. Uh, so I understand what you're saying there, but then I always beg the question of, well, if, if that's all you want to do, is this the best way of doing it, or is there a more efficient way of doing it that achieves the same ends? And then second, to your point, the fact that they're able to shut down a very legitimate conversation about improvements and upgrades shows you a problem of governance. How do we know the proportions? Maybe only 10% are the don't upgrade anything Church of Satoshi, and 90% are we want smart contracts yesterday. How do we know? There's no governance system. There's no on-chain voting system. There's no way to poll the public and express vote. And what does it mean to own and hold a Bitcoin? Do you have any rights for that? You know, you can build in a decentralized organization rights embedded within the token itself. But for some bizarre and alien reason, we've never gotten there with Bitcoin. So there are no rights for it. You hold it, it has value, but it gives you nothing. Meanwhile, all these third generation protocols, they're saying, if you hold it, you can delegate, you can vote. And it's, some are even writing constitutions and embedding them and so forth. So if I'm coming from, an, from the outside, an average everyday person, and they say, okay, there is option A and there's option B. Option A only does one thing. It's very hostile to any change or outsiders. And it's very expensive to maintain, but it's been around for a long time. And option B, you can participate, you can vote, you can delegate, you have a voice, you have choice, you have a government, you can debate things and people take you seriously. Oh, and, and by the way, you can use it to enable ICOs and STOs and RealFi and DeFi and NFTs and whatever your heart's content is. 
and it every three years it gets magically better and faster and cheaper and more meaningful and governments will eventually start integrating it which one would you rather have you know and the, the bitcoin people say well obviously a you know and everything else we're going to change everything else we're going to change all the governments we're going to change all society but we only need to do a i say well how do you vote Bitcoin, how do you do that? Layer two protocols, what are they actually when you dig under the hood? Very federated or highly centralized, controlled by a small group of actors. How is that any better than the BIS? How is that any better than any central bank? How is that any better than any institution? In fact, it's worse because at least those institutions as quasi-governmental or governmental are subject to audit and oversight and democratic processes. These other things are just controlled by people who are completely unaccountable, unelected, and basically meritocratic. That's Google, that's Microsoft, that's Amazon, that's Facebook. Are we getting along with the surveillance economy they've constructed and the control they have over the internet? Absolutely not. No one's really happy about that. Yet we wanna just go and trade them for another group of people and have no provisions to hold them accountable because Bitcoin's not going to do it. You have to upgrade Bitcoin to create smart contracts and have all of these other things. I mean, if Bitcoin was upgradable, there would be, as I said, no Ethereum. Vitalik would have built Ethereum as an overlay protocol on Bitcoin. That's what he was trying to do. He first tried to do it on Prime Coin, and he was working on Color Coins and Master Coin. Uh, this was the obvious approach to him. He said, well, it already has a network effect and everything. He wasn't trying to get rich. He wasn't trying to issue a token. He was just trying to solve a legitimate problem. Uh, and he had no idea that Ethereum was going to be so big. Had he known, we'd probably been a lot more careful with the way we founded it and all the contracts in the beginning. It was just a bunch of people who were deeply frustrated. I did BitShares because there was no way to do an algorithmic stablecoin on Bitcoin. There was no way to do a decentralized exchange on Bitcoin. There was no way to even conceive of this technology. And as an overlay protocol, it's super expensive to maintain and has a very kludgy years of experience. Your onboard is you have to buy Bitcoin, get into this overlay system, you do all this stuff in the overlay system, and then you settle here. It takes hours to come in and out of the system, and every transaction bundled here is expensive to do, and then the core developers are attacking you. Uh, originally, when Op Return came out and MasterCoin was using, core developers say, how dare you pollute the blockchain with all this garbage? Go create another cryptocurrency. Like, uh, and they had the same umbrage with Namecoin and all these other things. Then people did, and then they yeah. investigated them for that. Because yeah. that's, you you're a shitcoin, and you're an evil human being, and a scammer, and how dare you do these things, and so forth. Well, I think the Scott Stornetta really said it best. So he cited four out of the eight times in the Satoshi White Paper, it's the inventor of blockchain technology, and he said, you know, Bitcoin got the ball over the net. People were trying for a really long time to figure out how do you have something that's decentralized that right. people can trust. But he says that our future is going to be this multi-coin, multi-chain universe. We're right. going to have all these systems. You're going to have people who say, listen, I want something simple. I, I just want something that is expensive and I can't really use for transactions. But it's a store of value and it's going to sit there and it's simple and I don't need to worry about delegating and I don't need to worry about governance because I can't be bothered and I have a full-time job and I'm doing all of that. Right. So they're going to choose that. But then all of the people who do want all of that will go to things like Cardano, will go to all of the incredible innovative projects out there. And I think that he's right. I think we're going moving into this scenario where there isn't just one money. We're so used to government enforced monopolies with the money supply that it's really kind of got us blinders on us all. Right. We're like, there can be only one. And it, I just don't see why there can be only one without a government enforced monopoly. It's not like we have barriers, like physical barriers right. to holding multiple coins in our pocket anymore. Like we have phones that can hold as much as we want. Like I do not see any barrier to having interchangeable monies that all coexist and interoperate and we can choose whichever is best for whichever purpose at the time. We're already seeing that. We're seeing right. cultures evolve around, you know, Cardano very much focused on developed nations, which is really exciting. Uh, you have other projects that have different niche communities. They're all starting to evolve and they're catering to different people's needs, which is so exciting because right. we've had this blanket right. that's like one size fits all and you must enjoy it. And we don't need that anymore. Like that's, that's the exciting part about all of this. We have the choice. It, it, what's really amazing about all of it is no one seems to use common sense when they think about this. I, you know, mathematics, the first thing they teach you is the argue by analogy. So you have these super hard problems in mathematics. And you can't solve them. So what you do is you say, well, what's a simpler problem that's somewhat similar to it? And if I solve that, it teaches me something about the harder problem I want to solve. And every now and then you get lucky, it actually shows you a path to solve the harder problem. 
So you say, okay, is there going to be one cryptocurrency? You say, okay, is there one thing of anything in the history of humanity? <laughs> is there one language? Is there one religion? Is there one sexual orientation? Is there one what? No. W human beings are creatures of spice and diversity, of life and vibrance. We always love the fact that we have lots of options. If you go into a, a grocery store and you only see one breakfast cereal, you say, I need to leave this Soviet country and go to somewhere that's sensible, you know, because you'd say, I want to see Fruit Loops, I want to see Cheerios, I want to see actual competition, because maybe I wake up and I want sugar, and maybe I wake up and I want fruit the next day. Well, similarly, when you think about cryptocurrencies, because these technologies cover things that are much more serious than the movement of data packets, they're talking about the way we express ourselves, the way we associate, the way we conduct commerce. This is as deeply personal as a religion is, or as clothing is, or as languages are. There is no way you can create ubiquitous consensus on one collection of trade-offs. Every protocol has its own set of trade-offs. You give something, you gain something. For one group of people, they're okay with that. For another group of people, they're not. Uh, so what you have to accept is an internet of blockchains. And what you have to do is take a step back and start with the end in mind, the consumer, and say, what are the experiences five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we want to see? So for example, the concept of a universal wallet. I want, in 2030, I go to Starbucks or McDonald's or someplace, and I have my phone, they say, that'll be $11, I tap it, I pay, and I pay them whatever asset I want. And somehow they get paid in whatever asset they want. So I had tokenized silver on my phone. I had airline miles on my phone. I had data capacity from an ISP on my phone. Like, I had you know, fractionalized ownership of my home. That's a non-fungible item, right? right? Okay, I had all kinds of shit. And there's some market somewhere that's being enabled by this amazing crypto utopia that somehow transformed whatever the hell that was into euros or pesos or dollars. Or maybe if I'm doing treasury management for a company and they say something like, hey, let's take a position in Microsoft stock. Their customers are actually doing that. So when you go to Starbucks and they're buying things for all the Starbucks in Detroit, when they're accepting payment, they're actually buying shares for two hours in Microsoft. This is the world we can enable, you know, very quickly, completely on a cell phone, completely seamless. I pay them what I want, they get paid what they want. It's their business, it's my business, no one cares. There's decentralization in between. That's an end that is magical and wonderful because we're no longer then at the mercy of a Fortune 500 bank or a government or capital control or inflation or other things. I can build my wealth any way I want. If I'm concerned that the dollar's falling out, I can have tokenized timber inside my portfolio. I can do all kinds of crazy shit. And it's just there, and the cost of doing it is nothing. And it's available equally to Bill Gates as it is the coffee farmer in Ethiopia. Both of them have the same system. The same thing can be for uh, your cell phone usage. You know, I have a phone, and I can have a little dial on my phone, and on one side of it, I could say, I only ever want to spend $5 a month for phone access. On the other side of it, you can turn it all the way up and say, I don't care what I spend, but I want to have 5G speeds, maximum speeds, always connected, roaming between the networks for whichever one gives me the best signal, because I'm a super business guy and I need to never drop a call. Okay, well, why do we have that experience? Well, because of telco monopolies and silos and things. It turns out the very same thing, the same set of technology that allows you to have that first thing, the universal wallet, allows you to have that dial on your phone, also allows you to do the elections of nation states. So. You know, I'm a politician and I'm doing something very controversial. I say, what do the people think? You push a button, it suddenly as an NFT, a vote token shows up on your phone. And there's a question, do you think we should do this? Yes, no. Yes goes to one address, no goes to the other address. You've just pulled the entire nation state instantly with an 80, 90% voting rate for free. The same technology that enables that enables the dial, a dial enables the university wallet. You just keep walking one after another, after another, after another. And by the way, they're all open. They're open source, patent free, equal participation, and the economics are built in a way where the cost falls, the quality improves, and the speed, efficiency, throughput, all these things get better. And uh, they get more universal. So that means the least amongst us have access to the same systems as the best amongst us, as the richest amongst us, the most uh, privileged amongst us in society. Uh, we've never had a time in human history where that's been the case. It's always been proximity to wealth and power decided your status and wake in life. The further away you were from it, the li more likely you were working as a slave in an iron mine. 
Okay, now we live in a situation where you live anywhere in the world, no matter where you're born with the geographic lottery, you will have access to the same system as a king does. That's magical. That's the world I want. I don't give a shit about whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or Cardano. I just know what classes of technology needs to be and what the philosophy needs to be. And I also understand you have to also build a government in parallel with this, because if it's a system for the people, by the people, the system needs to be run by the people. It needs to be governed by them. You need to have a, a seat at the table. I don't have that with Bitcoin. You know, I have a 500 person company. We have armies of scientists. We've written 111 papers. I'm a fucking billionaire for God's sakes. And I don't have a seat at the table with Bitcoin. So if I don't have a seat for love of God, after all that we've done, like NEPA pals and the improvements, the proof of work and so forth, you tell me about the shepherd in Senegal and everybody else. What seat do they have? And you're telling me that's the system we need to inculcate and install and build in, and that's the values of decentralization? No, that's the values of a small group of people who got phenomenally lucky. And they are now trying to hold on to that luck and that power for fear that if they let go of it and give it to the world, then they're going to lose it. And everything that makes them special for that brief moment in their life will go away with them. And it's, the sad part is it's the opposite reality. If they just let go and let the system evolve and grow, then we would move faster towards a world that would be better for each and every person. And that, that's what I think about. That's what I've devoted my life to. And now I'm in a position that we can just do this forever. Regardless if we make money this year or we don't make money this year, I, there's enough to do it forever. Uh, and everything we do is open source. Despite all of that, the maximalism and the toxicity in this space, to go to the negative side for a moment, is extraordinary. 